I'm John Gregg. Uh, I was born in Wilma, Arkansas, 1927. 1927. Right. Well, as I said, my father owned a farm. We own a 200-acre farm in Arkansas. 200-acre farm. Well, we still own it. And it's been divided amongst all of us children. Uh, each one of us have 18 acres. And we still have the big farmhouse, fish pond, and all that on the farm. And all of us children, uh, no one lives there. We use the, the farmhouse for the hunt club. But we each one pay our taxes. My tax is $12 a year on 18 acres. March of 46. I got an early graduation. I was drafted in 45, but I got an extension until March, and that's when I could have been able to finish high school. Ah, so where did you go to the receive uh, basic training? Fort Lee, Virginia. Tell me about the basic training. Well, basic training. Uh, it was boot camp. It was, it was rough, but for me it wasn't bad because I'm a farm boy. I've used to hard work on the farm. It's a picnic. Eight weeks of tra training, but some of the some of the uh, youngsters, you know, city boys, no hard work and everything. It was a little rough for them, but for me, I breezed through. How many siblings did you have? It's eleven of them. Eleven. Ele I'm the oldest of the eleven. Oldest son. Yeah, yeah, I'm the oldest of all. So, what was your special? It was infantry. Infantry. Right. That was the start. I only stayed in the infantry one year. So you learn how to sh shoot. Bibwack, read maps, you name it, that infantryman do, I did it. Very good. So, what happened after the boot camp? Where did you go? I went to Manila in the Philippines. I was there for two weeks. There back to Aishima, Japan, where I joined the 24th Infantry Regiment. Why were you in the Philippines? Well, they were sent, at the end of World War II, they were sending a lot of replacement troops to Manila uh -huh. to replace some of the troops that had been fighting for the last three years. But the war after war was over, then they started signing us to different outfits throughout uh, the Philippines and Japan. Most of them went, some went to Japan, some went to Okinawa, different places. Do you remember when you arrived in Japan? Yes, it was uh, the in, end of, uh, first of 47, Yoko, uh, Gifu, Japan. 47? Yes. You said 1947, what year, month? I don't know what month. That's been long. That's too long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How long you been in Japan? I uh, stayed in Japan from 1947 to 1950. 1950? Right. What did you do in Japan? Well, I was in infantry for all of 1947. At the end of 1947, they transferred about 200 troops to Yokohama, Japan. And I went into a truck company about three days Three months later, they deactivated and reactivated Amphibious Duck Company. That's a sea and land going vehicle. And that was my career. I started boat training there, and for the next 27 years, I was in Army ships. What was your rank and what was your salary? Well, well I retired Chief Warrant Officer W3. No, no, at the time in Japan. At the time in Japan, I got to Yokohama. I was E4. I made E5 sergeant before the Korean War. What do you mean E4 and E5? E4 is a corporal, same as a corporal. E5 is a sergeant. I see. And then uh, from in night, when the Korean War broke out, I went to Korea and I made sergeant first class in Korea. How much were you paid while you were in Japan? Seventy. $54 a month, beginning salary. When I made sergeant, I made $76 per month. So what did you do with that money? Well, I sent, I sent most of it home. Oh. And I had a, lot, a bank account at my hometown, and I would send the check to my mom and dad. I made an allotment. My mom and dad got a certain portion of it, and mine, my mother put in the bank for me. Very nice man. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Uh, how was life in Japan? Great. I I loved it, you know. I fell in love with a Japanese girl. Uh, would, would have been married hadn't been for the Korean War. Uh -huh. And that separated us. I never got back. So tell me about when you left for Korea. Oh, uh, we left for Korea on June of 1950. We, June what day? I don't know what day. How many days after the Korean War? About seven days after the war. Oh. And I left, my outfit was a duck company, and we was put aboard a landing craft utility called LST, mm -hmm. and 
Each company had 140 men. We had 38 ducks. And you've seen the up to sea and land go on. They would do five miles an hour on water, 50 miles an hour on land. But where were you in Korea? When did you I, la I, Korea? La I landed in Korea, a place called Pohong Dong. Pohong? Yeah, Pohong, Korea, not too far from Pusan. Yeah. And we stayed there until the invasion at Incheon. And we went. I went in with the invasion at Incheon. Oh, you were in the Incheon. I was with the invasion. At the end, of, once the beach was secure, my unit was responsible for offloading all equipment and supply, like ammunition, food, and whatnot, for the fighting troops. We offload. We stayed on the island of Wamidu, and we bit, pitched tents there. We'd go out to the ships in the harbor and take ammunition, food, and whatever, bring to the beach. And at that time, they didn't have a lot of trucks, so the duck could do 50 miles an hour on land. We followed the troops all the way to Seoul, taking supplies and ammunition until they got truck companies. Once they got the truck companies, we'd bring the equipment supply to the beach. Truck companies would take it to the fighting troops. Mm -hmm. Wow, so you were in charge of... I was, at that time, I was platoon sergeant. I was in charge of uh, 12 ducks. 12 ducks. Right. How was the situation when you landed in Incheon? Was it well, well, I didn't go into Incheon until the invasion. When I went to invasion, the Incheon had been secure. We didn't hit the beach until the, uh, the beach was secure. That's when my unit started following the infantry, taking supplies and everything. So it was safe? I was safe, yes. Mm -hmm. It was safe. Mm -hmm. um, and we stayed at Incheon. Until the Chinese made a big push, came across the Yalu River, then we had to get out. Uh, we left there. So you stayed there until Chinese came. We stayed right there. You, did, you one, didn't go. You didn't go further north. We didn't go further north. We went north, I say, for river crossings. That time, they didn't have a lot of engineers to build bridges. When they had to take infantry troops across the river, they'd call for my unit. We'd set up 10 or 15 ducks. Each duck could take 20 fighting troops. We'd take them across the Horn River or the Nocturn River. Then we'd go back to our unit. Mm. And we stayed there until the Ch Chinese made the big push. Then we had to leave there at night. And half of my unit went one direction. I was put on a ship with my 12 ducks and a post of my people. We didn't know where we were going, but they sent me back to Pusan. And my rest of my unit, we didn't know where they were. So I stayed in Pusan about a week, and I went to an organization commanded by Army Colonel, and he gave me supplies, the equipment stuff, and we pitched tents there. And after about a week, he told me, called me in, he wanted me to go back out to Hyundai, where we initially went in at, to, for ship to show operations for ammunition and supplies to K-9 Air Base for the jet fighters to use against the enemy. And I stayed there about two weeks before I found out where the rest of my company were. The ships that they had been employed on went back to Yokohama. Mm -hmm. So I stayed there with my troops and uh, about 16 troops, and we worked around the clock for about two weeks, and I got my, the rest of the unit back with the major headquarters, the officers, etc., and then my unit commander called me in and said, okay, y'all did a good job. I had a C-47 plane, says, you and your whole crew go to Yokohama and spend a week. Was there a dangerous moment? Not too much. Only time it was very dangerous is when we had to go out to make river cross. Normally, we were fairly well safe. When we had to make river cross, and it was dangerous, uh, we got shot up pretty bad on the Nocturn River. We were run up to take infantry troops across the other side that didn't have any bridges. So the G-2, which is intelligent, stated that the farther side of the beach was secure. No enemy there. Well, a duck only make five miles on the water. So we was about ten ducks going across with the infantry troops in the, in the duck. They wait till we got about halfway across. Then they open up on us. I mean, heavy duty. Mm -hmm. And the infantry people started firing back. And we, only, we lost one duck and a couple of people. But that is the only time we had any severe fighting. Normally we were safe. Just cold, cold, and cold. Mm -hmm. 
What was the most difficult thing during your service in Korea? Well, Korea, what it bothered me the most was seeing the suffering of the Korean people. You know, that, that bothered me more than even the cold. To see people dislodged from the villages, the mothers with all their own on their back, these big A-frames, just packs of clothing. One woman may have a baby on her arm, two, three children on her back, four or five hundred of them running from the enemy. Then they go here, and the next thing you know, they're moving to another. That was kind of heartening for me because I've been used to a good life on the farm in Arkansas. We lived a wonderful life. And to see those people suffer like that, mm -hmm. it, it really hurt me deep, you know. Have you been back to Korea? No, I haven't. I got an invitation back from the, uh, the president of South Korea last year. When I'm a widow, I lost my wife in 1989. All my oh. kids are out of college would all have Ph.D. and doctor's degree. And... Uh, I didn't go because I didn't want to go alone, but I got a letter from them, a nice letter, and I showed it a lot of my Korean friends up in Denby, and, but I decided not to go. Some of my club members went. I had a brother that was stationed there, and he liked it, so he volunteered to go back. They said, Korea is such a wonderful place. Now, everybody want to go to Korea. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, all American troops, they love And, you know, now you can take your dependents to Korea, you know. A friend on my street, young guy, he just got assigned to Korea, and he could take his family right along with him. Every, everything is modernized, you know, that American high school, Burger King, you name it, just like the states. Right. And it, the Korean people are very nice. Everybody been there love it. Letters? Oh, no, no, no. no. I, have, I, did that? you have a camera with you? No, you didn't, have, you didn't think about a camera. You just talk about keeping warm and doing your job. I, I had no pictures for me or anybody in Korea because at that time, uh, you didn't have uh, cameras like they have in Afghan, Afghanistan, Iraq. What few camera personnel are there normal with the fighting troops on the front line? Re echelon people, you never got your picture in the paper or camera. And you didn't, nobody had time to have their own cameras. You know, we didn't take any pictures. Well, I found many, many other Korean War veterans, they carried their own camera. That was in 1952, 1953, 1950 and 51. It was rough. You didn't worry about it. You don't find many people with pictures of 1950. Most of the one you see is after the war. I see. You see them in these villages and ceremonies with the uh, Korean people. Nice. That's after the war, after the hard fighting. In 50 and 51, you don't find many people with pictures. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this question. When you were in Japan, did there, was there a segregation policy? Yes, it was segregated. The army uh, se uh, segregation was disbanded in 1948. 48 but or 47? 1948. The executive order came out in 1948 that the army would not be segregated anymore. But the organization dragged their feet. They didn't fulfill, it didn't actually start till the Korean War. You still had black units and you had white units. Uh, Very few units was integrated until the Korean War. That's when they had full integration. When I went to Korea, the only white I had in my unit was a lieutenant, one white lieutenant. He was the company commander. And what happened back during those days of the segregated army, 90% of all black units was commanded by white officers. And nice, most of those officers was officers getting ready to get kicked out of the service. They couldn't make it in white units. Headquarters say we put them in charge of this black company, and if you can't make it there, they're gone. So normally you got a white officer that was signed to black trinity, for instance, in my trinity in Yokohama. We were the best company there ever were. But we had a dirty, racist white officer. I mean, he was so dirty that when we got ordered to go to Korea, 140 black troops, we got a weapon and a live ammunition. Now this officer knew that once his beat fit, feet hit the beach, we were going to shoot him. He was going to be dead. So he started fighting, running, and finally he was able to get relieved. And we went to Cold River with a young white second lieutenant, had never seen a duck before. We knew our job, so all he did just sit back and sign papers and let us run the company. And he made captain within a year, from second lieutenant to captain, based on what we were doing. But most of the black units that was commanded, now you had some units like the Tuskegee Airmen, there was a few other units with black officers. But for most of the units, even in the 24th Infantry Regiment, 
all the officers was white. It didn't bother me that much because I came from the South. I came from Arkansas. It was surrogated, but it wasn't bad, like Oak, Alabama and Mississippi. It was nothing like that, no hangings or anything. But there were certain places a black couldn't go, a uh, certain way you had to conduct yourself. But there, it was like, for instance, on the farm, highly integrated, white farm here, black farm here, white, black, and everybody had for 100, 200 acres, and we got along great. No problem whatsoever. And all these people own their own farm. So you got along real good. The only time you had a little problem when you went into the city. And that would get in with the poor whites where you heard somebody, hey, nigga. Well, you didn't hear that out on the country. People were very nice. We got on together. We fished together and swam and all that. But for me, after being from the South, it didn't bother me. I was used to it. So the only thing that bothered me was having my commander get out and call me negative names, and you couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. We, we was... We sleep in Quasin huts in Yokohama, mm -hmm. hardwood floors. You had a big inspection every Saturday morning. I mean, spotless inspection, the displays laid out. We would take a brush and GI the floor at night, lay out our display, and sleep on the floor that night. So we'd be ready for inspection the next morning. Our unit commander would come through in the first job in his notebook, taking down notes and everything, and he... Have you ever heard of talking about a white glove inspection? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. He come through with white gloves, and he would inspect that. It was 30-some men in each court, and he would inspect it, and he couldn't find anything to that was negative. Right. If one gig, all the troops have couldn't go to town that night. So one day he couldn't find anything. So he took a fork, took off the white gloves, and run the prong between the blade and did that till the glove turned dark. Uh-huh. Gig. And he restricted all of us because what he had did with that white glove. He couldn't find nothing negative. He fabricated something. So that's the type of thing you had to put up with a lot of white officers that was in charge of black troops. Were you that, angry? Yeah, everybody was angry. Not so much as at him, but some, hey, you want to go to town and go mid dance with the Japanese girls and have a Japanese beer? He was angry in that respect. But we had gotten conditioned to him mis mistreating us. We were, we were a very, very good officer. We got high presidential commendations in Korea. But that's the type of thing you put up with. And most of the young blacks at that time, especially one from the South, handled it better than blacks from the North. They hadn't witnessed that type of thing. But for me and a lot of my comrades from the South, we could handle it, you know. You just have to toughen it up and suck it up and go. Do you know how, how many African-American soldiers participated in Korean War? I do not. It was not like uh, Vietnam. It wasn't that many compared to Vietnam, um, Vietnam or Iraq. In Vietnam, about 40% of the troops was black. But in, in Korea, the only large black unit was 24th Infantry Regiment. They went 24th? 24th Infantry. Uh -huh. was all black unit with white officers. Now, now that organization, the 24 All Black Regiment of Fair Facts, received more Congressional Medal of Honor than any organization in Korea. It never made the paper. Didn't nobody know about it. About 10 years later, it was brought to light that they were the highest decorated organization in Korea, and they deactivated them and put them into white infantry units. All that information and history of that black unit was lost or let set aside. All of those Congressional Medals of Honor, there were 14 Congressional Medals of Honor out for the 24th Infantry Regiment, all black, before they mixed them in with the white unit. Nobody knew about it. they get away with the records. And it was one black sergeant started their research about 20 years ago, and it came out and it made history. The papers came out, the Ebony Magazine had articles on it about the records of the black soldiers during the Korean War. Another black unit, uh, you know about the Tuskegee Airmen, troops that train in Tuskegee, Alabama. Well, every year they have huge write-up and commentation on news about the fighting troops. There was a black fighter unit, 7th Self Pursuit Squadron, and they went to Germany, and it was they didn't want them to fly. The fight, white people said blacks couldn't fly planes and everything, so they finally got a chance to start flying. They called Tuskegee Airmen, about 10,000 of them, that includes the mechanics and all the support troops, and they, they had a black general. Mm -hmm. And they started flying escorts for bombers 
and they were flying with a P-51 Mustang, with the best plane the Army ever had. They set a record during World War II as the best protector of the bombers there were. And what reason being, white pilots were trying to make a record of themselves, trying to see who could shoot down the most enemy plane. The black troop the pilots escort, they stayed with the bomber. They had a long-range bomber. They would have five or six fighter planes, and they stayed with it. If the enemy came in, they would fight them off and stay with the bomber, protect the bomber. Whereas the white troops, they wanted to see who could get what's called ace, who could shoot down the most enemy plane. So they lead the bomber chasing the plane, the bomber gets shot down. So that's how the Tuskegee Airmen got their uh, name by protecting the bombers. And the, when they started out, all the bomber pilots were white. Nobody wanted the black guys to find te- uh, protection for them until they found out, hey, all the white bombers then wanted the Tuskegee Airmen because they protected the bombers. And every year, there's a, I've, I've talked to, at all of the military bases, they have one of the old, a couple of the colonels that flew there, that, and they tell history, and uh, they uh, have movies about the Tuskegee Airmen, the, what they did. So you said that the desegregation policy was implemented in 1948. The executive order was passed by the president in 1948. All units would be integrated, but major units didn't do it. The order was there, but they didn't follow through. So when you were in Korea in 1950, mm-hmm. did you see still the problems of those? No, it was no problem. We were all black. We got Before I left, we got one white troop in my company out of 140. In fact, a few just started coming in for replacements. But most of the units, were even at the end of the Korean War, most of the units were still black. They had mixed up to a certain extent. What was the happiest moment in your service in Korea? Well, in Korea, I guess when I left. Huh? <laughs> when I left. <laughs> when did you leave? When I, when I left coming back. When did you I, leave? I left in uh, July 51. I stayed an extra year. I mean, extra month. Mm. There was, there was, uh, people was uh, rotating. You got, you left Korea based on points. You got so many points for each year you were in Japan. You got so many points for each uh, combat mission you participated in. You got so many points for education. And when you reached a certain point level, you could go home. Right. And my, I was scheduled to go home, but my commander called me in, and he needed top-ranking people like me that were well-trained to stay there. So he called me in and asked me if I would stay one month, and I would be promoted from Sergeant First Class to Master Sergeant. And I said, I don't know about that. He said, well, Mr. Gregg, I said, Sergeant Gregg, we need you. And I said, okay. So he stood up. We shook hands. I saluted him. Went on back to my job. Two weeks later, I got that new six-stripe master sergeant. How did the war affect your life? It, did, it didn't affect me. It didn't affect me. Not positive, not negative? No, about basically the same. You know, I talk about it some, uh, to okay, maybe my son or my uh, daughter sometime, but they like me to talk about my experience, but most people don't. Do you have... Grandchildren or great grandchildren? Yeah, I have. I have grandchildren. They all, all. My oldest daughter is a lawyer. She's been a lawyer for about thirty years. My second daughter have a PhD from Women. I mean, University of Maryland. She is uh, on the staff at Gallaudet University, and my son have a master's in chemistry from Hampton Institute, and he's wow. a re, he's a research chemist with Goodyear. And now he's the highest ranking black in Goodyear. He's CEO of all the overseas Goodyear tire and rubber plants. Anything that you want to leave this to uh, interview? No, I, everything's fine. I was selected by Channel 10 last year during the Black History Month. I was on TV every morning at 7 o'clock for the entire month, mm-hmm. every, every Sunday morning, uh, ex- ex- explaining my career in the service from the 45 first to 46, and the from the segregated days, walking through until I retired, telling about the chain from integrate, segregation to integration, how it were on up the line until when I retired as Army ship captain in 1973. John, good drag good. Okay, All right. and this is for me. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you very much.